Hi everyone, I am Stephanie with Nine Health. It is Mental Health Awareness Month, and today we're talking about rural mental health, so in rural communities, some of the challenges that face people that live there in regards to access to care. I have several experts joining me today. We might even have one more joining us as well, but you can see them all on your screen right now. Before we get into it, I need to mention that support for our mental health education and screenings that you'll find at ninehealthfair.org is provided by Regis University. They ask how we ought to live. Learn more about Regis University's counseling and family therapy program at regis.edu. Um, you'll find a lot about their program there at, on their website. And um, we're hoping one of the professors from Regis will join us as well to talk about telehealth and access to care in, in rural communities. But if not, we have a ton of experts to talk to that can answer all of your questions. So please ask those in the comments if you have any questions. First, I'm joined via, via Zoom by Kate Greenberg. She's commissioner for the Colorado Department of Agriculture. Michelle Barnes, Executive Director for Colorado Department of Human Services. Tia Miller, Health Solutions Director of Crisis Services. Jacob Walter, a rancher from Trinidad. And Nine Health Expert, Dr. Kyle Coley, who's a cardiologist, but also an expert on preventive medicine, internal medicine, our expert on COVID and coronavirus. So Dr. Coley, can you first give us an update on COVID-19? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Stephanie. So as of yesterday at 4 p.m., we had 22,797 cases here in Colorado. Uh, we had 3,990 people hospitalized. And, and you may be aware we're counting deaths differently now. We're counting deaths uh, due to COVID and deaths among COVID. So the deaths due to COVID did cross 1,000. We have 1,001 deaths due to COVID. And one of the ongoing challenges in this pandemic has really been to get access to both medical care as well as mental health care to rural communities, testing in rural communities, and really trying to figure out how we could help some of these places because of the fact that they're rural doesn't just limit their access to care if there's an outbreak it also actually uh, increases the risk of the outbreak propagating there because they're sort of more cut off and isolated so rural health i think is a really important topic to talk about uh, nine health fair does have a number of resources that you can access if you are part of a rural community particularly free mental health screening resources that are quick and easy to take and can connect you with mental health services via telemedicine. So I would highly recommend doing that at a time like this where both medical care and mental health care are very limited in these communities. Yeah, and you know, even if you're just having a rough day, I'll take those screening tools on our website every now and then just to see a baseline of where I'm at. It's like five questions and takes a few minutes and gives you a score rating as far as whether you're anxious, depressed, and where you're, where you're at on that scale and whether you'd like to seek help out or not. So they are helpful tools at ninehealthfair.org. Just click on eTools. Let's get into some of our other topics today, though. Um, several people, I think, can answer this question. But Jacob, I'll start with you. Tell me why there's an urgent need for med mental health services in rural communities, some of the barriers to access. Definitely. I think, I think first and foremost, there's a, a huge stigma in rural communities, especially. Um, I think anytime we talk about mental health, there can be that, a stigma associated with it. Um, but our, our rural communities and our people in agriculture are, I would say, are definitely used to being kind of those strong pillars in communities. They're able to take care of their ranches, their families, their livelihoods and balance things. And so when something like mental health comes up that you can't physically see, it's, it puts a huge, um, I guess, just a different perspective. And it's hard for, I guess it's hard for people uh, to see. Right, and Tia, maybe you can add to that as well. You're the Health Solutions Director of Crisis Services, just you know the access to care and the need for mental health services in rural communities. Yeah, thanks. Uh, certainly, we are seeing a great deal more suicides in uh, rural Colorado in general. Southern Colorado has uh, 31.8 per 100,000 residents, which is significantly higher than the state average, which is 20.2 per 100,000 residents. So we know there is a great need in rural Colorado and certainly in Southern Colorado. And there's also just limited access due to transportation barriers or various barriers to getting that services when they need it and when they're ready for it. Yeah, we have some big news to share as well between the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Human Services. Yesterday, both departments released a rural mental health toolkit. So I wanna talk a little bit about how this partnership came together, how the state's addressing access to our barriers to access. Michelle, maybe you can touch on that as well. Again, Michelle Barnes, the director of the Department of Human Services. Sure. Um, the partnership isn't new. We've been, uh, quite a few organizations have been working together to try and increase um, 
our support to rural communities. Um, one of the things that we found as we've been this year really studying behavioral health and how we can do a better job serving all Coloradans. Uh, the tricky part is all Coloradans because the needs in a, um, in maybe a more metro area where there's providers available are different than the needs of someone who lives in more of a frontier um, community. So one of the other things we've also are really focusing on is we know stigma, as Jacob said, is one of the biggest barriers to people asking for help. Um, it's one thing to say, oh, I broke my leg. Of course, I'm going to the doctor. It's another thing to say, oh, I'm feeling depressed and I just can't shake it off. So I'm going to go to a health provider that's going to help me with my mental health. It's a there's still such a stigma that we're really finding, particularly in rural communities, that that's been a big barrier to people asking for and getting help. And so Colorado Department of Human Services has been partnering really, um, really hand in, hand in hand with the Department of Agriculture. And so maybe Kate can talk a little bit about what they're doing because they're taking the lead on this rural outreach regarding mental health. Yeah, Kate, if you want to add to that. Yeah, great. Thanks, Michelle. Um, as Michelle said, we've had this partnership uh, between CDHS and CDA for a number of years. Uh, what we launched yesterday was sort of the revamped effort um, to bring this message back out across Colorado. When the Department of Ag started the, our outreach program around mental health, uh, what we were seeing was very similar to what we saw back in the 80s farm crisis. And for those who lived through that time, uh, it was a tragic time for a lot of farm families. Um, prices plummeted, foreclosures skyrocketed, and a lot of families started losing their farms and their land. Um, and along with that, we saw increasing rates of suicide in our agricultural communities. So we started seeing those trends start to happen a few years back. You know, our, the department felt it was time to start doing that outreach, saying it's okay if you're struggling, we've got help. And that's where our partnership with Crisis Hotline and Crisis Services began. And that's really the work that, you know, we put an exclamation point on yesterday because, uh, you know, things are always tough in agriculture. Prices are, are bad for a lot of folks. You've got that stacked on top of weather and pandemic and other diseases to manage for, um, drought, uh, a lot of uh, sort of stacked uh, variables that producers are always managing. And that puts a lot of stress on individuals and on families. So. We, in this partnership, we want folks to know that they're not alone. They're certainly not, they don't have to struggle alone. And that we as a state, we as an ag community uh, and with our partners in public health uh, and human services are here to support anyone who is struggling. Yeah, that's all great stuff. And it's a great thing that you guys are providing. Jacob, you talked a little about, about the stigma in rural, health, rural communities, but can you talk about some of the cultural barriers maybe to ac accessing care? Yeah, definitely. I think the cultural barriers definitely play pretty hand in hand with the stigma um, portion of it. Uh, in rural communities, I guess, you know, when there's, if you can find a health provider, um, then, you know, you don't want to be, a lot of people don't want to be seen going into to some place and, and showing that, you know, um, I do have this problem. I think there's a kind of that same mentality of, you know, I can, I can take care of my animals, I can take care of my crops, um, I should be able to handle this. And uh, I think it's overcoming that mentality um, that is a big cultural um, block. We talked about healthcare workers on Tuesday, it seems kind of similar to that, you know, there's maybe a stigma of, you should be able to help yourself. So kind of deal with it on your own. I stopped my video on the Zoom chat just to see if that'll help our bandwidth a little bit. Um, hopefully you're able to hear us okay. I don't see anyone complaining on Facebook, but again, on Facebook, if you have questions, go ahead and ask those. Um, but we're gonna just continue on here. Dr. Coley, maybe you can weigh in a little bit just on access to care. Uh, for those that don't know right now, you know, a lot of providers are using telehealth, kind of how telehealth works and the, how important that resource is to a rural community. Yeah, access to care has been a real issue during the pandemic, but we've come up with some really creative solutions to it, I think, and I, telehealth in a way, uh, has broken down those barriers for access to care, uh, not just to rural communities, but actually even within our city, um, you know, people who live in the city but shouldn't be going to the doctor's office because they're high risk. So if you don't know how it works, it's essentially doing a FaceTime, a Zoom, uh, or some other secure platform conversation 
with your doctor. Sometimes telehealth can even mean talking to your doctor on the phone. It doesn't have to be a, a video uh, interface if you're not comfortable with that or don't have the technology to access that. But really recognize that it's reaching out to medical resources in different ways. So whether that's telephone, email, text message, or you know, a face-to-face -face interaction through a video interface, all of those are effective ways. And now that we've been doing this for some time, we actually have some data on the on what the benefits of telehealth are, and it's proving to be incredibly beneficial, not just for managing acute problems. So, you know, if you've got a specific acute medical problem or possibly a mental health question that needs to be addressed immediately, but also for managing chronic problems, things like diabetes and high blood pressure um, and high cholesterol. Now, certainly, uh, it's not quite the same as as being in the doctor's office and having the ability to of the doctor to examine you, uh, to check your EKG, to take your vital signs. But you know, in the absence of doing all of that, a lot of people have started doing home monitoring systems as well. And there are a lot of things you can buy on Amazon for you know under fifty dollars, like a blood pressure cup or pulse oximeter, or other things that can really help to bridge that gap. But I would strongly encourage you to try telehealth if you haven't done so, because it's not just a great way to connect with your physician, but it's also a great way to seek mental health services as well if you think you might need those. It's a great way to interact with friends and neighbors safely during this pandemic as well. So, and for the most part, you require minimal extra technology or tools. A lot of these services are free and there's, physicians have access to a lot of software as well, where they can just send you a text message and all you have to do is click on the, on the link to the text message and you can be connected to your physician. So if you don't know where to start, calling your doctor's office is a great place and just really try to think about doing it as a way to access care, not just today, but as part of your regular life as well moving forward. Yeah, and kind of related to that, we're going to talk about how COVID has affected rural communities in just a moment. But Michelle, can you weigh in on um, how Colorado Crisis Services has adapted to serving rural communities? Dr. Coley talked about, you know, services on the phone, tech services. Colorado Crisis Services definitely provides that. Can you just talk about how they've adapted? Um, yes, and um, I completely agree with Dr. Colicci that that has been a huge shift for us, is that we're doing a lot more services telephonically or over video. and um, for a lot of people that is working. For other people, it's not working. So we still know that there's a need for that face-to-face -face, um, services in some instances, particularly in more complex um, cases. But we've also um, staffed up the Colorado Crisis Services hotline. And we've seen over a 60% increase in calls from people from metro area as well as rural asking for help as they navigate through COVID. Um, most of the increase in calls have been directly related to concerns about COVID. Um, it could be, I'm afraid I'm going to lose my farm. I'm afraid um, I'm going to lose my home. I don't have enough food. Um, we're finding a lot of concerns that are around just basic um, needs within the community. Um, as Jacob was talking about the stigma that comes from uh, asking for help on mental health issues, we find the same thing in rural communities about asking for food assistance and help paying their utility bills and whatnot. There's a lot of resources out there for our neighbors in rural communities. And relative to the metro area, they're just not asking for it. So um, in addition to behavioral health, we're hoping they'll ask for a lot of other things. But we are staffed up. Community behavioral health centers are operating. They're seeing clients. They're seeing them in person when needed. They're seeing them by um, telemedicine, but we are here. There's no shortage of resources to help people who need help right now. Perfect. And I, I do want to introduce Dr. Fred Washburn. He, he's joined us as well. He's with Regis University, the Division of Counseling and Family Therapy. I have a couple questions for him and I'll ask him those in just a moment. But first, Tia, I wanted you to be able to add to what Michelle just talked about with um, Colorado Crisis Services as the Health Solutions Director of Crisis Services, just how um, but, you know, the crisis services line is adapted to serve rural communities. Yeah, I wanted to say that, that we are definitely uh, available to do telehealth, telecrisis assessments. We can do it telephonically or video conference. And um, as other people had shared, it's as simple as we can send a text message with the link and the person can click on that link and they will video be the connecting video conference to a crisis clinician that can support and help that individual. We've actually had um, some real positive response to that um, option for people in rural. 
historically, if we were to provide a crisis assessment to the Trinidad area, it may take a two hour drive for a staff person to get to that area. Now we can connect video conferencing within 15 to 20 minutes. So I think some people are actually quite enjoying that uh, uh, quicker access to a crisis clinician through telehealth. So there is, uh, even though, you know, we started this because of COVID and started doing a lot more telehealth through our rural communities, we were already, you know, expanding our telehealth through crisis in our rural communities prior to COVID. And I think we will see that this will uh, extend past COVID as well, because there has been a positive response. And I'll put the, um, I'm going to put the number for Colorado Crisis Services in the um, comments as well. Sorry, I was having trouble with my buttons. Um, I'm just looking at comments on Facebook. We did a, get a couple of people asking questions about it. Maybe telehealth. Someone's asking about HIPAA laws, maybe privacy related to telehealth. And what if the patient doesn't have a mobile device? Tia, since you were just talking about Colorado Crisis Services, maybe I'll let you um, start. Um, if the patient doesn't have a mobile device, elder folks that um, maybe don't adapt, this person said, what are options for them in a rural community? And then maybe just address privacy of telehealth and Colorado Crisis Services. Yeah, we, uh, we choose a platform that is HIPAA compliant. So our agency has a HIPAA compliant platform uh, that does not allow for any uh, hacking or being able to connect. Uh, certainly being able to be in a private area and communicate with your clinician is helpful. So being able to be in an environment that allows for that conversation certainly is very helpful. I We understand that there is uh, various areas around in rural Colorado that has very poor internet or Wi-Fi access. And so therefore they, even if they have a cell phone, they may not have um, service in their area. We provided iPads to various locations throughout our rural communities. So uh, Health Solutions provided some uh, iPads in the Trinidad area, in the Wilsonburg area, in a lot of our rural communities in, with law enforcement. Law enforcement has some access to some iPads and technology. So that for those people who don't have technology or who has some difficulties connecting through, uh, through their internet, then we can provide telehealth through that iPad device. We can also still provide face-to-face. -face. I know that sometimes it's not always ideal to provide telehealth for some people. And our job is to meet that person in crisis would, by whatever means is appropriate for that person. And so sometimes a face-to-face -face assessment is the appropriate response. So we can still provide that even with COVID. We do the best we can to maintain social distancing and uh, the care for our staff as well as the person we're responding to. We don't want to make that person ill either. So we wanna put all the appropriate precautions in place before providing that face-to-face, -face, but we will still provide that. Great, thank you for answering that question. Dr. Washburn, I'll let you introduce yourself now since you joined us a little later. And my first question for you is, I know you're training students at Regis to use telehealth services. So maybe just talk about the work that's being done. Yeah, hi, I apologize for coming in late. I had the wrong link. So I was waiting on the page by myself, but it's good to see everybody. Um, yeah, um, at, at Regis, we've uh, partnered uh, with uh, Nine Health and Southeast Health, and we are providing uh, telehealth counseling services uh, to rural areas. And so this summer, uh, what we've established is we have a group of five graduates uh, who just graduated from our program uh, who will be providing these free counseling services um, to Coloradans in rural areas under the supervision of faculty. Um, and our hope is, is to expand that, to include telehealth services as part of our training experience for students. Um, we, we believe it will be a way to reach out uh, to more of Colorado uh, to fulfill uh, Regis's mission um, to, uh, to serve the underserved as well as provide a unique training experience for our students. Um, to get them trained in both uh, a demographic uh, in, in a rural area that they maybe would not typically, as well as training with uh, telehealth services. We're very excited about that. Yeah, that is exciting. Again, Regis is helping fund our mental health screening tools that you'll find at ninehealthfair.org slash etools. You can find screenings for depression and anxiety on there. Um, and Dr. Washburn, well, since we, you could join us a little later, I want to give you a chance to chime in a little more. Um, I know you're also helping Nine Health pilot a mental health program in Southeast Colorado. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
Yeah. So um, that's the the summer project uh, that, that we have okay. going on right now. Yep. So that is what I spoke on. Um, but we are very excited. Um, our students are excited. Um, we're hoping that this will be a, a long standing partnership and be able to provide services uh, to many people uh, across Colorado. Yeah, I think with COVID-19, a lot of providers were kind of, you know, maybe thinking about telehealth services or dabbling in it. And now they're all kind of thrown into it and have to you know, maybe do it a lot more than they were in the past. I do want to uh, talk a little bit about how COVID's affected rural communities. Kate, can you just weigh in a little bit about that and some of the mental health impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, happy to. Um, I mentioned earlier that, you know, ag also always deals with stacked uh, challenges, right? Weather, markets, prices. Um, you've got that stacked on top of the legacy for the intergenerational family farms and ranches that you know it's on incumbent on the current generation to keep that legacy alive. Uh, and then now with COVID, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, you know, of course, ag is critical business, so we've been very blessed that we can stay open for business. Uh, but that also means there's a lot of responsibility on producers to keep their workers safe, to keep their workforce uh, supported and healthy through this time. And there's so, you know, farmers and ranchers, as well as all ag workers throughout the supply chain are dealing with that uncertainty. How do I keep my team safe? How do I keep myself safe? And how do I keep producing food uh, for everyone, you know, throughout the state and the country um, at this time? So, you know, I think that's a lot of added stress. We've also seen an incredible uh, pivot in, in where demand is in the marketplace. So with restaurants shut down, you know, we spent approximately 40% of our meals were spent out eating out at restaurants, food service. Um, now with all that shut down, we've got that supply in the chain, but we've had to pivot to where the demand is to actually get the supply to people, which is primarily grocery stores. Um, you also see that with a big pivot in direct to market sales. So our producers who are able to sell um, direct, you know, beef directly to, to buyers or produce uh, through you know, community supported agriculture, farmers markets, they've also had to make a big pivot to adapt their operations to a COVID-19 scenario. Um, so you've got just incredible ingenuity, entrepreneurship and new kind of responsibility in getting product to market, protecting people along the way, and a lot of questions about, you know, am I going to make enough money this year to, to stay in it for another season? Um, it's always a perennial question, but this year you just got so many other va variables stacked on top of the basic ones that the, the uncertainty is, is ripe and folks are adapting and making it work, but it remains a lot to be seen about how this year will shake out. Yeah, and Dr. Washburn, you talked about this program being part of, you know, something this summer for students. So obviously, we'll still be in the COVID-19 pandemic. Is there any additional training that you guys are doing with students in regards to COVID-19? Um, with regards to responding to clients with during this pandemic? Just with mental health impacts of COVID-19 and, you know, any, I guess, any additional things you're having to teach students or train students on? Yeah, um, so there are a couple of things that uh, have expanded beyond what we would typically do with students. And, and part of that is just uh, telephonic training in general of all of our courses have moved to an online format. So training our students to be uh, successful learners as well as providers with that. Uh, but on top of that, uh, one of the unique trainings um, that we provide our students are, are helping people find safe spaces within their homes. Right, so typically when we look at a counseling environment, someone's entering into a counseling room and that room becomes a safe space. And so helping individuals find those spaces uh, within their homes has really been a unique benefit uh, in, in training that we can give to our students. Uh, we believe that will help increase uh, self-care um, as well as allow people to uh, create uh, areas of safety uh, for themselves um, in addition to that, uh, one of the things that we have seen with our students in, in providing these services is that uh, even though this pandemic is, is drastic and dramatic and is having uh, consequences, uh, pervasive consequences, um, people are still dealing with the difficulties of life that they faced before. And so, and in some instances, the pandemic has increased those. And so we've been trying to pay particular attention to children um, who sometimes are forgotten in this pandemic, especially if they are in unsafe environments in and of themselves, um, right? Where school was maybe a way for them to, 
to be in a safer spot than home. And so we've been really helping our students to try and uh, reach out to those who may have been forgotten uh, throughout the process. Now we've talked a little bit about that before. Michelle Barnes, maybe you want to add to that just on the resources the state has for, you know, reporting child abuse right now and neglect with kids not in school. It may not be seen as much, but, um, you know, where people can turn. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, what we're seeing with the state has a statewide hotline that people can call if they have any concerns about a child or a family. This may not be that you, it's not to call because you think there's abuse. It's to call because you notice the kids don't seem to have enough to eat or you notice the, that there's a change in behavior, any concern. And then um, trained um, social workers will work with the family and see if they can get more support to them, more services to them. Um, so it's really a way to open a door of resources. The, that child abuse and neglect hotline has traditionally gotten the majority of its calls from teachers. And just as you said, um, coaches, people that are seeing the kids every day in a normal school environment. With school being shut down um, for in-person um, sessions, we've seen the number of calls to that hotline go down by half, which is huge because we all know that child abuse and neglect did not go down by half. So what we're finding is without all those eyes on kiddos that um, problems are going unreported. So I'm thrilled to hear that you're um, helping get your um, students to ha have an eye for that. And we as Coloradans all need to have an eye for that. There is a phone number people can call if you have any concerns at all. Um, and, and trust that a trained person will evaluate whether that's a legitimate concern or not. And it's 1-844-CO, Colorado, for the number four kids, 1-844-CO4KIDS. And that's staffed 24 seven. And we have resources um, to respond in every single corner of Colorado. Yeah, thank you for answering that question. I know it wasn't on our list of things to talk about, but definitely kids in rural communities as well and still something yeah. important to address. Um, before we go, uh, Dr. Coley, I wanted to get some just advice from you. We, we touched on how COVID's affected rural communities, but really just talk about how it's affected all of us, some of the mental health impacts, and maybe just some advice that you can give before we sign off here. Yeah, so we just actually had a recent report come out in Lancet Psychiatry about the possibilities of COVID-19, the infection itself, as well as the pandemic and what the long-term consequences are. So let's first talk about the infection. So <coughs> we're getting most of our data actually from SARS and MERS because we obviously don't have long-term data for COVID, but it seems like being infected with COVID-19 and recovering can lead to long-term consequences such as depression, anxiety, and particularly PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. So that was certainly very eye-opening because, you know, even as people are recovering and coming back to their normal lives, they could have long-term mental health consequences from just the infection. And then, of course, there are the mental health consequences of the pandemic that affect even those that are not infected. And those can be widely variable, including things like uh, mental health disorders like anxiety, depression, substance abuse, but also isolation. You know, we're seeing a growing sense of isolation, which was previously just a problem in our elderly community, but now is starting to impact impact many more of us. We're also seeing potential for mental health problems in kids and adolescents um, who are the age group that are particularly vulnerable because they may not quite understand why we're doing what we're doing. And they're also still developing their relationships and their behavior with people. And we've suddenly had to dramatically change how we interact with each other. Um, and there's some literature that this may in the long term also affect the way that infants and toddlers start to develop their social behaviors, how they learn emotions, how they learn to interact with adults, especially if the adults are wearing masks all the time. So really a dramatic impact from the mental health fallout of this pandemic, both directly from the infection and also the indirect effects that we've seen. So the first step in fixing this is really recognizing this as a problem, which is why I think these types of sessions are incredibly important. The second step, once you've recognized, is to work on finding those resources. And we have an incredible number of resources in our state and through Nine Health Fair that can really help you to start to battle these. So we talk about flattening the curve of the pandemic, but one of the big curves that we need to work on flattening is the mental health curve because that's going to last for many more years yeah. even after this pandemic is over so i really hope that you take this to heart and really reach out to these resources as much as you can 
Yeah, I think that's well said. And um, I'm going to let all these experts go because I've kept them for a while. But again, if you have any questions, you can post those in the feed and we can get them answered for you. Um, I do want to say that you, um, again, at nonehealthfair.org, as Dr. Chloe mentioned, we have resources. You, there's mental health screenings there for depression, anxiety. Just click on our e-tools. Um, and as Dr. Washburn talked about, we're expanding to the southeast area of Colorado to get some mental health services down there with their Regis students. And we want to thank Regis for providing, uh, you know, support for that. And if you're interested in being kind of one of these people that's helping out, you belong at Regis University's Counseling and Family Therapy Program. Just visit, visit regis.edu for more on that. And also as well, if um, you know someone that doesn't have access to watch our Facebook Live and ask questions, or if you have an additional health question you want answered, whether it's mental health or medical, or even on the coronavirus, you can call our Nine Health Neighbors line at 303-698-4455, extension 2005. Just leave a message and a nine health medical volunteer will call you back within 24 hours and you can talk to a real person and ask your questions. I want to thank everyone again for joining us. We're going to sign off for now. Again, ask your questions if you still have them and we'll see everyone next time. Thanks so much. Thank you.